Uh, here we are in a chemistry course we are writing a lot of mathematical expressions, but as we had said uh, in the introductory video itself uh, mathematics is the language of science and we cannot do uh, anything related with quantum mechanics without using math and the math we are using is very simple. And before going further uh, let me just share something with you. We are many of us are scared of calculus and I used to be I still am and we are writing a lot of uh, equations in like del del y del del 2 del 2 del something 2 so on and so forth. But have you noticed something we have hardly done any calculus so far what we are doing really is some very simple algebra we are doing algebra with operators which contains derivatives and all ok. So, it is really not as scary as it looks so I thought I will just say it once. Uh, so, that uh, students who have taken this course with a lot of enthusiasm do not get uh, scared off there is nothing to be scared of. If you can handle chemistry, if you can uh, understand reaction mechanisms, if you can uh, work out sequences of organic reactions this should not be difficult for you ok. There is an atrocious uh, joke that I usually say in this context uh, borrowed from a very senior colleague. But since this is going in public domain I will not say that uh, let us just uh, say this there is nothing to be afraid we are not doing any mathematics that is uh, beyond us let us have faith in us and we will be fine ok. With that uh, brief message let us continue with what we were doing we have written uh, developed the classical description of quantum uh, of uh, angular momentum from there we have built a quantum mechanical description as well. Okay. And we have written down the expressions of well we have not really written down the expression of L square operator, but we said that it is something in spherical polar coordinates. The operator of big of utmost importance that we will have is this minus i h cross del del phi which is the L z operator and what L square operator is, is we will see in a moment all right. So, now with this background knowing what angular momentum is and knowing how we uh, handle angular momentum in quantum mechanics let us go ahead and learn some important properties of angular momenta in quantum mechanical systems. Of course, remember we are talking about operators so far so there must be wave functions also. So, these operators will operate on those wave functions to give you the value of uh, angular momentum or its square or one of its components and so on and so forth. So, first we are going to talk about uh, L square and L z operators. This is the uh, L square, square operator as promised minus h cross square 1 by sin theta del del theta operating on sin theta del del theta plus 1 by sin square theta del 2 del phi 2 and the moment you see this you will remember perhaps that we have already encountered this when we talked about uh, rigid rotor right. And in fact you would remember that this modified just a little uh, finds its place in the uh, uh, as the Hamiltonian of the rigid rotor system ok and L z also is something that we know. Now, we are going to uh, discuss a very interesting and important and perhaps uh, leading to some intriguing discussion of these operators and that is written in the headline we will see that L square and L z actually commute we are going to show it. What is the meaning of commutation that means uh, the sequence of operation does not matter ok. Uh, you make you take a function make L z operate on it get another function make L square operate on that function ok you get some answer. Then go back to that original function make L square operate on it perhaps it is best if I write not very sure if I have written it later, but I will write anyway which color ink is the good this. So, let us say I have some function f I have some function f 
I make LZ operate on it. So, I will get some function maybe f dash. So, I make L square operate on it. I get say some function f double dash. Okay. Here dash and double dash do not mean first and second derivatives, just some function. So, what we have got here is that f double dash is equal to L square L z f. Now, what I am saying is that if I reverse it, make L square operate on f, we get something now I am running out of dashes. So, maybe I will write f subscript dash and now I make L z operate on this f subscript dash I get say f subscript double dash that is equal to L z oh this I have written incorrectly actually sorry about that. So, I will just erase this and I will take it from here. So, uh, L z operates on f to give you f dash, L square operates on f dash to give you f double dash, then we will say f double dash is equal to start from f, L z has operated on it first, then L square has operated on it. So, L square L z f that is f double dash and here L square operated first on f to give you L z f subscript dash then L z operated on f subscript dash to give you say f double subscript double dash this f subscript double dash is start from f this time your L square operates on f first then L z operates on the new function. So, what we are saying is you will see that f double dash equal to f subscript double dash okay? that means uh, that would mean that they commute. Just erase this because I do not exactly remember uh, where things are going to pop up in the screen. Yeah, so this is LZ. Let us see if they commute or not. So, first we will take the uh, this sequence, make LZ operate on F first, then L square will operate on it. So, what do I get? You have F, F is a function. Lz is minus i h cross del del phi that operates on f, then this L square operator operates on the new function. How do I go about it? Well, f is a, an arbitrary function in theta and phi of course. First of all, I can take this minus i h cross out because it is a constant. So, I have one minus sign here, another minus sign here, they give me minus 1, uh, sorry, they give me plus 1 minus into minus and the constant I get outside is i h cross cube, i h cross cube comes out. Next what I do is I take f in, so here I get del f del phi. Now look at the second term, this is when I operate L square on the whole thing I am going to get 2 terms right, I will have to handle 2 terms. I will take the second term first, here I have del f del phi and I am operating it twice with respect to phi. So, what do I get from here? I will get del 3 del phi 3 sorry del 3 f del phi 3 is it clear? Here I have del f del phi I am differentiating it twice with respect to phi. So, I get del 3 f del phi 3 that is a second term and what about the first term? this one goes here. So, basically I have del f del phi I have to differentiate it with respect to, d, uh, to theta. So, here I am going to get del 2 f del theta del phi. Okay? So, this is what I will get L square operating on L z f gives me i h cube multiplied by 1 by sin theta del del theta sin theta del 2 f del theta del phi plus 1 by sin square theta del 3 f del phi 3. 
Now I want you to pause the video for a minute and work out the next one. I want you to work out what Lz L square f will be. Of course, in that case we just altered the sequence of the two operators. Please do it for yourself and tell me what you get. I mean you cannot tell me what you get unfortunately not right now, but uh, see for yourself what you get. I hope uh, you have got this answer, you took f in here and there and this del del phi and del 2 del phi 2 once again give you del 3 f del phi 3 in the second term we multiplied by the same 1 by sin square theta and del del phi of del f del theta is once again del 2 f well del phi del theta whether you write del 2 f del phi del theta or whether you write del 2 f del theta del phi does not matter it is one and the same. So, I hope you have figured out by yourself that you get the same expression L square L z f and L square I made a mistake here peril of copy paste. Uh, so, let me again correct by hand. This was L square L z f what I have here is L z operator comes first. So, you see we can make mistakes while uh, writing too many things. Please make sure that if there is a mistake you are aware of it and you correct it ok, should not learn something is wrong ok. So, we got L square L z f and L z L square they are uh, the same expression ok. Why do I need f because I mean how do I work with operators unless it, they operate on some function that is why. Okay, so, this is what we have got oh man I have done it time and again. So, L square L z f minus just write it all over again L z L square f is equal to 0 ok which means L square L z minus L z L square is equal to 0 ok. Just uh, reverse the sequence of operation you get the same answer. So, you subtract the uh, resultant functions you are going to get 0 right because you get the same function no matter whether you make L z operate first or whether you make L square operate first. Okay. So, L square L z minus L z L square equal to 0 ok. So, remember this is a mistake. So, L square L z minus L z L, L square equal to 0 this is how you write it this cannot be a mistake fortunately. So, this is how you write it the commutator is equal to 0 commutator means this L square L z minus L z L square it is written as L square hat comma L z hat in third bracket that is how you denote commutator in uh, quantum mechanics commutator just means two functions a and b a b minus b a that is a commutator you write it as a comma b. So, L square L and L z commutator is equal to 0 right. So, the commutator is 0 the operators commute same on the same thing. Now, the question that is logical to ask after so much of discussion is so what and all right commutator is 0. And how does it matter? To uh, know how it matters we need to go back to the uh, basics of quantum mechanics a little bit, uh, take a holiday brief holiday from uh, angular momentum and talk in terms of two general operators and that is what we will do now. Uh, perhaps we should have done it at the beginning, but we really wanted to get on with the show without going into too much of nitty gritty. So, we will do it now, now that we need it. Now, we are going to learn the answer to that question so what if it commutes. So, to do that let us say a hat is an operator b hat is an operator and phi a and phi b are two functions. Let us say to start with phi a is a, an Eigen function of a with an Eigen value of a phi b is an Eigen function of b with an Eigen value of b and let us say that a and b commute right 
commutator of a and b equal to 0. Okay. Now, we can write like this a b minus b a operating on phi a equal to 0. Why do you have to write phi a? Why not phi b? You can write phi b who is stopping you? I am writing phi a. You can do the other one. In fact, I encourage you to do the other one and convince yourself that you get the same result. Okay. A b minus b a operating on phi a gives you 0. Now, we now know the sequence of operations. If I write a b phi a that means b operates on phi a first and a operates on the resultant function and if you write b a phi a that means a operates on phi a first and then b operates on it. So, a operating on b phi a minus b operating on a phi a gives you 0. Then we already know what a phi a is right a phi a is the eigenvalue a multiplied by phi a. So, we can write that a operating on b phi a minus b operating on a phi a is equal to 0. So, that can be rearranged to a operating on b phi a and we take this b hat term on the right hand side. So, that minus sign goes moreover uh, remember we are using linear operators. So, an operator operating on a wave function multiplied by a constant gives you uh, that constant comes out and the operator operates on the uh, wave function. Well, in case you did not understand what I said, this is what it means. It means b operating on phi a multiplied by phi a, remember a is a constant is equal to a multiplied by b operating on phi a. Okay. A operating on b phi a is equal to a multiplied by b operating on phi a. Now, will you agree with me that this is an eigenvalue equation? Eigenvalue equation in what? Eigenvalue equation in b phi a. See, I can write this b phi a as psi. This b phi a I can write as psi. So, what is the equation we have got? We have got uh, a hat operating on psi has given me a multiplied by psi. We have got our good old eigenvalue equation and eigenvalue equation in b phi a psi is equal to b phi a. Okay? So, b phi a is an Eigen function of a. Moreover, what is the Eigen value of b phi a? Yeah, psi is equal to b phi a, right? So, Eigen value is a. So, b phi a has the same Eigen value a for the cap a hat operator as phi a. Okay? What is the Eigen value of phi a for a hat operator? It is a. What is the Eigen value of uh, b? phi a that is also equal to a that is what I am saying Eigen value is the same. So, then we can write that b phi a is equal to c phi a. Okay? Um, let me now erase what I had written earlier because the next thing might actually pop up there. So, uh, see a operating on phi a is equal to a phi a that we have started with. Now, what is a operating on c phi a? This is what I was talking about when I said something about linear operators. What is a hat operating on c phi a? That is going to be c multiplied by a hat phi a, right? c will come out and now what is a phi a? That is again a multiplied by phi a, small a multiplied by phi a. So, you get c a multiplied by phi a, you can write it as a c multiplied by phi a. Okay. So, uh, you get this since uh, you have the same Eigen function you see c phi a has the same Eigen function as phi a itself for a hat operator and that is what holds exactly for b hat phi a. That is why uh, it is abundantly clear that b hat phi a is equal to c phi a. Problem with quantum mechanics is that uh, sometimes uh, we lose our way 
while we meander through so much of uh, mathematical manipulation. I hope we have not lost our way now. Your advantage is that you can always go back and replay the video. But what I hope you can see easily is that b phi a is equal to c phi a. This is again an eigenvalue equation. So, what are we saying here? We are saying that phi a which is actually an eigenvalue of a hat sorry phi a which is an eigenfunction of a hat is also an eigenfunction of p hat. Herein lies the significance of commutation. Phi a is an eigenfunction of p hat if a hat and b hat commute. Okay? So, this is one of the golden rules of quantum mechanics operators that commute have a common set of eigenfunctions. Okay? Please make sure you understand this before going further. Uh, as I said it is very important that we do not lose our way in the maze of mathematical manipulation. It is very important that at the end of the day if you forget all the mathematics the physical insights sink and stay with us. Okay? What we have learned from this is that for commuting uh, operators there are common sets of eigenfunctions. What does that mean? It means that associated properties, the property associated with A and property associated with B can be determined simultaneously. This is the most significant physical outcome of the discussion we have had. Associated properties with the two operators can be determined simultaneously and that should remind us of something that we have again studied in higher secondary. We know that x and px position and momentum cannot be determined simultaneously with uh, any certainty right that is uncertainty principle. Where does that come from? It comes from here x and px actually do not commute. I leave it to you to work out uh, to uh, read it by yourself it is there in all standard physical chemistry books uh, x and px do not commute you get something like ih cross. That is why x and px cannot be determined simultaneously. What is the meaning of determining simultaneously? That means you should have a well defined Eigen function for a hat operator well defined Eigen function of b hat operator. A hat is, oper uh, is associated with some property b hat is associated with some property. If they have a common set of Eigen functions that means these Eigen values small a and small v can be determined precisely at the same time from the same functions. Remember how quantum mechanics works? The information whatever information is contained in the wave function can be brought out by uh, applying the appropriate operator, the operator associated with that physical quantity. So, if the uh, wave function knows the answer for the value of that property, it will spit it out as the Eigen value. What we are saying is that if you have a uh, simultaneously if you have a set of Eigen functions for two different operators that means you have Eigen values for the two corresponding properties. So, the two properties can be determined simultaneously. Very, very important and uh, profound uh, quantum mechanical concept uh, something that is very central to quantum mechanics. Okay. Uh, so, we are very happy that L square and L z commute. So, uh, L square and L z can be uh, determined together is not it? They have same set of Eigen functions we said. So, we can determine L square and L z together. Now, think what we have done in rigid rotor. We have always talked about the total momentum from L square and we have talked about z component of angular momentum. Why? Because we have we can determine these two together because L square hat and L z hat are uh, commuting uh, operators they commute. Okay? This is a very important take home message and this sort of tells us why is it that uh, we always talk about L z and L together. The uh, corollary that should come out is that why do we not talk about L x and L y? Okay, we know L we know L, L z. So, it will be so nice if you can find out L x and L y as well. 
actually we cannot that is where uncertainty sets in because I have not worked it out myself it is worked out in pillars book to some extent uh, and you can work it out yourself now with a little it is a little tedious that is all. But just believe me when I say that LX and LY, LY and LZ, LZ and LX do not commute. So LX and LY commutator is IH cross LZ that is very beautiful result right because this is what is used in things like NMR, spectra, uh, NMR uh, spectroscopy uh, to find out uh, the different components of electrons uh, nuclear spin. LY and LZ commutator is IH cross into LX, LZ and LX commutator is IH cross LY. Okay. So you cannot determine the X component and Y component together. You, if you try to do that uh, I mean you will not get anything. So, a corollary to corollary question that can arise is that okay, we understand that. So, we understand that you can determine total angular momentum and z component of angular momentum simultaneously. We also understand that you cannot determine x component of angular momentum and z component of angular momentum simultaneously. But can we determine uh, L square and Lx simultaneously? Can we determine L square and Lz simultaneously? The answer is yes we can L square and Lx actually commute, L square and Ly actually commute, Lx and Ly do not commute with each other, Ly and Lz do not commute with each other. So uh, first point we can determine any of the components and total angular momentum together. But the moment we do that the other two components are not defined. Remember L square capital L square is equal to Lx square plus Ly square plus Lz square. So if you have determined say Ly square then you also know Lx square plus Lz square. But from there you cannot find Lx square or you cannot find Lx or Ly separate you will not be able to separate it out that is uh, from uncertainty principle okay? because Lx and Ly themselves do not commute. Okay, and that you can uh, replace x by y, y by z answer will remain the same. Why do we always talk about z? First it is convention we always like to define z as a unique axis. Second is it makes our life so much simpler. You have seen that the operator in uh, spherical polar coordinates for Lz is so simple and for Lx and Ly it is quite complicated. So our life is simpler if we do this right that is why. Okay. So uh, this is what we have that you cannot determine the components two components of angular momentum simultaneously you can determine the total angular momentum and one of the components simultaneously great. Now with that understanding let us conclude this part of the discussion with something really nice and something that we sort of skipped giving a hand waving argument while talking about rigid rotor. <coughs> I am talking about why is it there an upper limit of magnetic quantum number. To do that let us work with Lz operator, L square operator and the uh, spherical harmonics the wave function for rigid rotor. We will get the same wave function for hydrogen atom later on. So now <coughs> We know that these two operators commute, right? So why don't we do this? We'll make Lz operate on the spherical harmonics. This is what we get. And of course, del del phi will operate only on e to the power i m phi, and will give me i m, i and i give you minus one, minus one, minus one, plus one. You will be left with m h cross. We know this. And uh, what we can do, of course, is we can. Before we do that, we can bring this polynomial in cos theta and normalization constant out because as far as phi is concerned these are all constants. So this is what we get yeah i h cross n j p m j cos theta comes out multiplied by i m multiplied by e m phi that finally gives me h cross m multiplied by the spherical harmonics. Okay. Uh, we are familiar with this this is the eigenvalue equation for L z okay. we know this already. Now let us make Lx square operate on it, Lz square. Well, let us find out what Lz square is. Okay. What is Lz square? I do not have need an operator for it because I know the eigenvalue. So I just square the eigenvalue that is what I will get. 
do I square the wave function as well? No, no, please do not. Okay, it is not as if you are squaring both the sides. When I write LZ square, I means I make LZ operator operate on the wave function twice. So, this is your wave function, you take this and make the uh, LZ operator operate on it once again. What do you get? You get another H cross multiplied by m, right? m here remember is magnetic quantum number. So, you get H cross square m square. Okay, please do not think that I have uh, squared it like uh, uh, some uh, number or something. Okay? Uh, square of operator means uh, operating twice. Okay. So, we have LZ square and we already know what L square is. So, what we will do is we are going to subtract, subtract this L z square from L y square okay? so from L square. I will subtract this L z square from L square where L is total angular momentum this is what we get. So, we can simplify this a little bit we can write L square minus L z square operating on y function of theta phi gives me uh, this minus you can neglect that is a typo again h cross square multiplied by j into j plus 1 minus m square multiplied by y theta phi again an eigenvalue equation. How have I got this eigenvalue equation by taking the eigenvalue equations of L square and L z square subtracting them from one, one another okay? that has led to another eigenvalue equation which in which the operator is L square minus L z square eigenvalue is h cross square multiplied by j into j plus 1 minus m square. Now see what is this operator l square minus l z square. We briefly mentioned this a little while ago. Will you agree with me if I say that this operator is l x square plus l y square? Because the total angular momentum operator l square we had said this at the beginning of our discussion previous module this is actually l square plus y square. Huh? So, L square plus Y square operator has an Eigen value of H cross square multiplied by this. Now, we come to an again simple but important to understand concept. Can L X square whatever the value is can it ever be negative? No right because the square of the X component of angular momentum we may not be able to determine it, but uh, it is a real quantity. So, its square will always be a positive number. What about uh, y component same thing. So, uh, will you agree with me if I say that L x square operator L x square plus L y square operator must have a positive Eigen value real positive Eigen value yeah? because it is a sum of two positive quantities L x square can never give you negative quantity because L x itself is a real quantity it is not an imaginary quantity. So, this has to be greater than equal to 0 you see that we are there which means j into j plus 1 has to be greater than equal to m square or I can simply say that mod m has to be less than equal to j. Okay, I can just neglect this j this one to get this uh, get rid of this square. Okay. Here we uh, now understand why is it that there is an upper cap to the modulus of magnetic quantum number m mod m is less than or equal to j this is where it comes from. So, to summarize we have learned that uh, if operators commute then the, the properties that they uh, stand for can be determined simultaneously. What we have not done is that uh, this non commuting operators uh, which have properties that cannot be determined simultaneously that leads to uncertainty principle that I have left for you to do as self study. We have learned that total mo angular momentum total angular momentum operator sorry I miss the crucial angular word here and one of its component these are uh, these operators are commuting. So, uh, these properties are determinable simultaneously, but if you take a pair of components they are not determinable simultaneously. And finally, we have learned how this leads to an upper limit of magnetic quantum number. I hope you have found this discussion on angular momentum uh, very uh, interesting and fruitful. There is more to angular momentum, but uh, once again we do not want to lose our way uh, 
before uh, in all this maze of what seems like mathematical manipulation. So, we will take another holiday from angular momentum after this. We will go on and discuss something that we are familiar with that is hydrogen atom. Then uh, while talking about uh, multi electron atoms perhaps if we feel it is required we might uh, discuss about angular momentum in a little more detail. I really have not made up my mind about that, but we will see. But next on agenda coming up is hydrogen atom.